Hi everyone, welcome to Gallery Baird. We are doing a very special artist interview this month with Danielle Potwin, whose work is up on the Gallery Baird website for the month of July. And her work is going to be able to be viewed in person at Side Row Collective in Seattle uh, for the summer of 2021. So welcome Danielle, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. So normally we, um, don't do a video call for our interviews, but we have decided that we wanted to kind of have more of a conversation with you about your work. And we're so excited that you're our first in-person show since uh, February of 2019. So um, we're just really excited to work with you. And you were the first Gallery Baird artist, I believe. Yes. The first feature ever. Yeah. So that's pretty yeah. cool. In so April. 2019, yeah. Yeah. Wow, yeah. The first question that we're going to ask you is a gallery bared staple. We always ask this. <laughs> so you are a new addition to the cram box. Oh what God. color are you? Ah, I remember the first time I was asked this and it's definitely shifted. I've been thinking about this a little bit because uh, I had a feeling you would throw this my way. I would say that to answer directly and then kind of give a little bit of a thought around it is I feel like I would be like a multicolored crayon like I would be, um, I feel like I would be primary colors. Um, uh, so like the red and maybe a warmer yellow, kind of like what I'm wearing now. Um, I've kind of fallen in love with that color and then the blue. I've been teaching color theory the last few years and uh, it's color has always been something that I've used in my work, but I've been even more fascinated with the way that color theory in thinking about how the color wheel works and how colors work together. And so I kind of like the idea of being a primary color crayon. I also, I think like it speaks to my thinking um, about like what is primary, right? What is secondary? What is tertiary? Um, and just thinking about those kinds of things in regards to like color relationships, but also other relationships um, in that way. You are a teacher um, <laughs> as well as a practicing artist. So we wanted to know um, how teaching has impacted your art practice or vice versa. I feel like the energy of my students and the excitement that they have is infectious. Teaching is part of my practice. I love being able to help people discover like what they love as far as making goes. And I feel like it also, teaching also pushes me to practice what I preach in a way. And then the same is true about my practice. I love the play period of my practice because then it's all of these discoveries, right? Like right now, um, I'm starting the part of my year that is the play practice where I'm like paint, gessoing cardboard boxes and you know throwing paint at stuff and and really playing with texture and and color and line and different ways that i haven't been without a direction right like just trying to kind of yeah. play with materials and and also research the beauty of being a practicing artist as a teacher is that because you're working in the studio and you know even if not consistently it doesn't matter right um you're sharing student with students discoveries that you're making in regards to what a practice is. And so it better helps them understand um, like how to move forward and, and also in writing curriculum too. Just for clarification, um, so you are an art teacher and what grades are you teaching? I teach high school and I teach ceramics. I'm um, working on building a sculpture program, which is what my education is in and also teach foundations courses so basic drawing color theory a lot of the times i have students come into my classroom or i talk to adults who haven't been in the classroom in a really long time and what's sad for me to hear is that people are like oh i'm not an artist right or oh i i can't draw i can draw stick figures like that's the couple of things that i hear and if you're talking about representational drawing it's a skill that's all it is you know i hear a lot of them say oh i'm i'm bad at this like and this is the worst like I and I was like well no you're just unpracticed especially with the skill of representational drawing it requires practice I like that phrase you use the, you're unpracticed I feel like that's a really great way to think about that instead of saying you know like I'm not good at it well I'm I don't have practice in it I think when we say good or bad it puts value it's like a it's a value right. Right. And, and you really can't quantify drawing skills. <laughs> like, I don't think that that's yeah. fair. I think about language all the time. And so specifically in my work, I'm thinking about it, but then I'm also thinking about how to shift the way we think about art making and think about that kind of idea of quantification, how to better just get in the studio and make art versus trying to put a grade on something or try to be like, oh, 
you know, there's so much talent here, right? Um, it's really, it's it's about practice. So we do want to talk about your show, Seep Sopping, which is on Gallery Baird for the month of July. And I wanted to ask, how did this body of artwork, how did this idea kind of come to fruition for you? Part of it was that I work with a crit group here in Boston that started a daily drawing prompt for the month of August of, uh, during the pandemic. I had been drawing before that, I had been like making here and there, um, but since starting teaching, I didn't really have a consistent studio practice with a direction. This happened back in August of 2020 on the heels of my grandfather passing. And my grandfather uh, was a Navy communications officer. Um, and so he used Morse code. And so I was like, oh, I'm gonna make Morse code drawings. I don't know what I'm gonna do with them, but I'm just gonna do that for the month of August. So what I found myself doing, which it comes into pretty much all of my work is, is kind of taking things that loved ones had said to me and putting them into Morse code. Part of it is, is privacy, right? Like I don't wanna necessarily put out exactly what someone says to me, yeah. um, but if I'm gonna do that, in a way, I, I kind of want people to figure it out on their own. I could have just put up text, right? And that would have been fine. But I, I also think that there's something really interesting about interpreting language and having to dig a little bit deeper to look into someone else's life. I want my work to be accessible, but I also think that a lot of my work asks people to stay a little longer in it and to investigate more. And it started with just like simple, like on the paper, like in my sketchbook, um, which actually are part, some of the sketchbook pages from the very beginning of that practice are in um, some of the books that I made. It just started like that. And then I was like, you know, I really want more precision. So then I started measuring the lines because Morse code is very rhythmic and very consistent. It had to be, right? Because you're communicating not in words, you're communicating in, in dits and does. And so it has to be very specific. So I was like, well, I can't not have this Morse code be all over the place. It has to be standardized in a way. And I don't know what that looks like. So I went through a lot of phases to fit, to get to the final drawings that, um, that will be, well, some of the final drawings that'll be installed. You have a lot of books that are featured in the show. So can you talk a little bit more about your bookmaking and bookbinding process? I started making books when I was an undergrad. Someone had introduced me to artist books and I can't remember exactly who it was, but I started writing poetry again, but I wanted to make visual poetry and I had no idea how to bind books. And I was like, I don't have time to learn how to do this right now. I just want to make a book. I'm going to put all these typewritten pages together because I had, I purchased a typewriter and was like so excited about the feel of the keys and the punching and the pressure and how that would shift. I would like sew those together. Like I remember actually drilling holes into the first book I made on, on the drill press and then like sewing it by hand. And then the next one I made was like out of tissue paper. I had no experience bookbinding, but I, I love the process. And I really think that using alternative materials speaks from my sculpture background. Like I'm like, oh, paper, great. But what would happen if I sew tissue paper together? I took a course with Sonia Almeida at Brandeis University in 2018. And she opened my eyes to so many different techniques in bookmaking and I fell in love with it. I wanted to make books, but I wasn't sure how I wanted to bind them or what I wanted to use. I knew I kind of wanted to use drawings and I was really thinking about family albums and scrapbooks. When I was a kid, I used to make scrapbooks of everything, you know, put movie tickets in there and photographs. And back in the eighties, uh, they there were these photo album scrapbook things that had this like really beautiful sticky paper that you would like pull off and then you'd like lay everything down and then like put the paper back over and like rub everything over it. Just love that process of like documenting moments and like moments in time or making records of that. And I really haven't done scrapbooking since I was a kid. And I was like, you know, I, I think I kind of want to do this and really create a timeline of relationships in my life with loved ones. The books themselves are not, they're not huge, right? But they, I feel like that they illustrate moments with these individuals that are things that I don't want to forget. I've like always wanted to learn how to work in leather. I remember one of my professors in undergrad being like, you should work with leather. And I'm like, yeah, sure, cool. But I never got around to it. And so I was like, you know what, I want to do that. And I think leather also speaks to bookbinding in, in a huge way, which is why I wanted to use it. But then the bubble wrap was more thinking about how we, how we keep relationships precious and how we protect the people we love. I really love that relationship between the material and your your thought process with the, with the books and the meaning behind all of that. 
can you talk a little bit more about your your choice for materials for the different pieces in this collection? For most of the drawings, the ones that have the Morse code kind of dug into them, I really wanted like a meaty paper. I wanted something that could take some, um, that could take gouache in, in a watered down kind of way. I love hot press watercolor paper. Um, because I'm not really fond of the toothiness of the cold press. For me, it's distracting for what's going on on the paper. As I moved into the final iterations of these drawings, I was like, ah, oh, if I'm gonna dig into this paper, it's gonna take a beating. Like I can't just like take a tool and kind of like dig a hole in it um, and have it tear. I wanted a really nice, um, a really nice cut. And I think that speaks to just my need for precision in some aspects of the work. I've seen a theme in my work a lot over the years where it's like this precision, but then this like relinquishing of control. The clay piece that I have, that I've put in um, to the show is something that I've been playing with in the studio and thinking a lot about impressions of objects. There's something about impressing an object and seeing what happens. So I think that's part of like the clay work. I've been working a lot with water-based medium. <laughs> And I, I'm sure I could be quoted many times over in undergrad being like, I hate watercolor. Yet here I am uh, showing work with, uh, with uh, watercolor markers and these beautiful wa watercolors that my partner got me and gouache, which I didn't realize just how luscious it was until I really was playing with it with these pieces. The richness of the pigment and the gouache and the way that it still holds onto that pigment as it flows is just mm, so, so sexy. Thinking about that, that loss or that like precision and relinquishing of the control with the watercolor markers. There's this like, I'm gonna lay the line down and then I'm gonna wash it out. I'm just gonna like let things drip and change and move. So I think that those drawings speak really specifically to that kind of, um, that kind of play and that kind of um, dichotomy, if you will. I was just looking at the anticipation series that you have that's up on the gallery website when you're talking about watercolor. It's very free flowing, but then it's also, I mean, representations of the human body. Uh, at least that's how I'm interpreting them. These are some of my, some of my favorite pieces in the in the whole collection. I love being in the water as I feel like swimming specifically like competitively or whatnot. Um, the water is a challenge, but it also embraces you. Family is obviously a very prominent theme in this work. You mentioned your grandfather and the Morse code and writing the messages that, you know, loved ones have said to you. Um, so this is obviously very present in your work. So we're, we're just going to ask like a super uh, big picture question. So how would you define family? That's so interesting because this work specifically is about my relationship mostly with intimate partners, right? Mm -hmm. And my daughter and my intimate partners are my family. I definitely think of them as that. Like when you ask me to define family, I think more about characteristics. If I was to think about those characteristics, they would be like mutual respect, emotional support. Not like as a, oh my God, I need this all the time, but as some like, oh, I'm having a hard time, please help. Quality time is like the most important thing for me. And especially when, when um, people that I love are present with me. Like they're there and they are listening and we are doing something together. I also think like the acceptance of who I am as a person, it has been, at least in the last couple of years, has been really important. Don't have the expectation that I'm going to change for you. That comes from, you know, a life um, up until that point of changing who I am to suit other people. And I think that that's not where I want to be ever again. Sometimes I think we as like, or, you know, in a female body or, you know, female identified body, um, that can sometimes happen, right? We lose ourselves in order to please other people. And that's based on what society expects of us. I'm grateful and humbled by the fact that I have people in my life who are like, you who you are. Talking, you know, about self-acceptance, I'm just thinking in my own experience, a lesson that I definitely had to learn going into intimate relationships is like, you you can't go in and try and change somebody. You really have to take them at face value and, you know, see if your values align. And I mean, it seems like a very obvious, like simple thing, but you know, it's not, I mean, the smaller things, you know, like, oh, can you not like leave your dishes on the table? Like that stuff's, you know, negotiable. Yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, that's not a deal breaker for me, maybe for someone else it is, but like- that's not. That's so, that's super minor in the grand scheme of things. I mean, life is so short, right? Like, yeah. you know, yeah, my partner and I 
will sometimes, you know, have a like, oh, I can't believe you did this thing. That's like such a small part of our relationship. And that's like the only place where we kind of like butt heads, which is really nice. I wanted to go back to something that you said about this, like self-acceptance and like meeting someone where they are, I think is what you said, or like seeing them for who they are, right? Uh, seeing them at, 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 taking them at face value. Something that I realized very recently um, through conversation with a very close friend is that falling in love with the potential of someone, like the falling in love with like an idea of someone? The idea of what someone could be, yeah. right? Knowing that they have potential before they do and not necessarily trying to change them, but knowing that they have that in them is something that I I've, I did for a really long time. And I think that that didn't suit what I wanted my family structure to be. I can't, and I think it's not great for to do this, is like keep living in that, like what could be versus yeah. what is. And I think meditation has really pushed me to think about that and be more aware of it. I did want to circle back to something you said when you were talking about family and how um, having a physical presence with someone is like a very important moment for you. Obviously, we haven't been able to have a lot of physical presence in the past, whatever, year and a half at, at this point. We do always ask, well, we started asking since the pandemic, um, each of our artists, how quarantine affected their practice. So we were just wondering how things maybe altered for you. A large portion of this body of work came from the inability to be in close proximity to one of my partners. Mm -hmm. But I think that a large part of how we were able to be close to each other was more about the emotional connection versus the physical, which wasn't, was super infrequent. Like I think there was, I don't think, I know. <laughs> there was twice in the span of a year and a half or a year or so that we were able to just actually touch each other. And it was so precious and, and strange. I do value that. It's the first time I've ever been in a relationship like that because we started actually close to the beginning of the pandemic. It was really an interesting kind of getting to know someone emotionally and then, and then having all these moments that were so strong because that's what we had. I mean, I feel like all of my work in the past has always had a little like inkling of something to do with, you know, my intimate relationships or, you know, based on form or material or something someone said to me. But this specifically has been a lot of like that translation of that lack of closeness physically. That's, I think, the, a large part of the body of work. A, a lot of it actually is from that. Um, so I guess in, in a way, that's how, you know, the pandemic had changed, <laughs> but kind of like, you know, informed my practice. I taught in person this entire year with a span of maybe a couple months, maybe of remote teaching. You know, I had the shift back and forth and I was at home a lot. I had already had kind of a home studio set up, but it was a very small space. And then I, I kind of shifted and said, you know what, this is, I need to be able to make here, which is really difficult for me because I don't like to make at home. I've talked about this with many people. It's like, oh, well, the dishes are in the sink. There's laundry to be folded. Uh, my daughter, you know, is also in remote class. She probably hasn't eaten yet. <laughs> like, it's just so much. Um, and so I think I've actually been able to find a way to separate, you know, throw the headphones on, set a timer, like just go to work. I personally have a question. Um, <laughs> okay. I do not know the story of, but I'm intrigued as to how you and Vanessa met and connected and, and that whole story. Was it in Sculpture Studio? I don't remember like a specific moment where we met. You both were going to Mass Art, right? Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. And we're both in the Sculpture Department. The, the studio space is next door. I don't yeah. think we were in the same room, but the all the rooms connected. So like we were all in and out of the spaces. I feel like where we really connected was uh, in our like senior year, we had to take the course. It was like life, work and money or something. Oh yeah, life, <laughs> art, money or something like that. Yeah, and it was great because we had Sandrine Schaefer who uh, they're excellent. Um, they're, they're really awesome. Oh my God. Like I, I just kept remember saying to them, I, I just, I remember I was like, oh, like, I'm so glad I'm with you. Like, this yeah. is so good. Cause they just have such a great perspective and uh, such a way of thinking and investigating and researching and, ah, oh, so good. Um, but that's really, I feel like where we really connected cause we were writing artist statements together and we were like, we were editing each other's uh, resumes and we were doing yeah. like manifestos and stuff. Like it was crazy. Um, but I really do think that that's like where we kind of solidified 
our connection. Yeah, I think it was building up to that point because before that, I know you did a show that I was in. Yes. Oh yeah, that's right. So I curated that yeah, the line. We have been in shows and like things like that together. So yeah, because I curated the line form show, and I was like, I want you in the show. Like you're doing these things that are amazing, and I need to have your work in the show. <laughs> <laughs> Come, come to me. <laughs> show I've cur I loved curating that show. It was so much fun, and and um, your work is so good that I was like, mm, yes, please. <laughs> so going back to like the objectification, like the moment, like that, those moments of touch that could happen, mm -hmm. and then the moments of of touch that you know moments that weren't actually touching, but like standing back and like viewing the body. In the moments where you do see touching, you know, there's specific, right, really specific moments like the roast beef Wellington piece where like I was hiking with my partner and I fell through the ice of a pond. And <laughs> when we got back to the car, he was testing my toes to make sure that they weren't, <laughs> that I could still feel them. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a really sweet moment and a really like nurturing moment. I felt like I was, because he was touching me and because that was something that was like hard to do. It was me kind of stepping back and seeing it from like a different perspective and being like, oh, oh, that's, oh, right. Um, that's, that's something that is necessary in this moment. Well, I'm glad you're okay. Falling through a pond does not sound like a good time at all. <laughs> it, was a, it was, um, <laughs> I was, I was, wa I was marched to the car. <laughs> It was like, I kind of like stumbled out of the pond and then, cause it was only up to like, let me be clear. It was only up to my knees. I wasn't like, you know, up to my neck, Yeah, but, um, <laughs> but still, yeah, it was, I was, I was like, yeah, let's walk out on the ice <laughs> <laughs> at the edge of the, at the edge of the pond. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Danielle, thank you so much for joining us and chatting with us about your work. We are so excited to be showing your work in person and online. Where can people find you? What is your um, social media names? <laughs> What's my handle? You can find me on Instagram at dmpotwin um, or my website, daniellempotwin.com. A lot of the work that's on the site is older. This work um, currently will be up shortly, but yeah. Well, thank you again. And if you are interested in viewing Danielle's work, again, it is on the Gallery of Baird uh, website and Instagram page all throughout the month of July. And then we will have it in our archives tab on our website following July. So thank you for watching and we'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.